Good morning to everybody and all our participants. This morning, we'd like to offer some insight on one of the Red River Valley COVID-19 task force has been working on. Well, I've had a lot of questions about this, and I want you to understand how this unified team works. Introducing my co-chair, Director of Fargo Class Public Health, Desi Fleming, will start us off today. Thank you, Mayor, and good morning. And today, I'd like to give an umbrella overview of our task force. The Red River Valley COVID-19 Task Force was formed at the request of Governor Burgum on May 7th. Shortly thereafter, 13 partner organizations began work to determine how to best address COVID and the impact in our community, which included prioritizing strategies and activities. The first priority identified was targeted COVID testing. A subgroup of local medical and public health experts came together to pinpoint those individuals who are at higher risk of exposure and developed a testing matrix accordingly. Since our locally generated testing matrix has been implemented, we have been able to focus our limited resources solely on targeted testing. The increase in positive cases shows that our testing strategy is effective. A rise in cases is, is expected with targeted testing. The numbers will go up before they can go down. This combined with effective contact tracing and isolation measures will eventually lead to a decrease in positive cases. This is the test, trace, and isolate process referred to in the state briefings. One of the most effective tools in the fight against the spread of COVID is contact tracing. Contact tracing involves, through phone interviews, identifying close contacts that have been exposed to a positive case. Each case gives, on average, five contacts. There's a large group of individuals in our metro area assisting with contact tracing. Currently in Cass County, our contact tracers are following 595 active cases and 1,200 contacts. If you receive a phone call from a contact tracer, please assist them by providing as much detail as you possibly can. We all know how many phone scam calls we receive from numbers that we don't know. It's understandable to be cautious, but these contact tracing calls are very important in protecting our community. The third process used to slow the spread, depending on the individual's COVID status, is isolation or quarantine. Simply put, isolation separates infected or sick people with a contagious disease from the people who are not sick. Quarantine separates and restricts the movement of people who are exposed to a contagious disease to see if they become sick. Once a positive or close contact case has been identified, individuals are provided with education on how to best isolate or quarantine within their environment. This has proven to be more difficult for some depending on their living or financial situations. So the task force has also been working on quarantine support activities, which Nicole Crutchfield will address shortly. As I've said before in all our task force activities, individual privacy is important and will be protected. We will not be announcing numbers based on individual testing sites. For the purpose of protecting public health, any information shared will be on a need to know basis. Our task force is aware of how extremely important communication and education is given this new virus, it's a new experience for all of us and information changes rapidly. Recently, we have added a page to our website for the Red River Valley COVID-19 Task Force. There's a question and comment section that's available to the public. The Task Force Communications team will do their best to answer any questions or comments in a timely manner. You can find that page at fargocastpublichealth.com slash task force. As restrictions are loosening across our state and things feel like they're getting back to normal, they really are not. As Cass County numbers have increased, there's a lot of people asking, what's up with Cass County? Why can't they follow the rules? There's nothing wrong with our county. There is a lot we are doing well as a community. And yes, there are some things that we can all do better. Wearing a mask in public is a simple act that everyone can do to help slow the spread. Physical distancing, even while being outside, is another. It's warming up and we've all earned some time to enjoy the outdoors after our long winter. We all need to find that balance between spending time doing the things we enjoy while still being aware that we are in the midst of a pandemic. We all have a responsibility to keep up the prevention measures we've learned. We all influence the outcome. As always, be kind, be safe, and be smart. Thank you. Thank you, Desi. The task force has taken a proactive afford, uh, to approach to this problem. We have four static sites and we have a 
testing team, three testing teams that can go to different places if we need to. We're continuing to talk about our testing matrix and try to figure out where to go. It has to do with your occupation, your living environment, exposure to positive cases, and scientific data. Testing per capita in Cass County is very high. Do I have the slides? And one time we had a single high and that's of 93 cases in the community, but that also means that we're testing more. By testing more, we'll have more tests that are positive. I know people I got concerned about the numbers we're finding, but by isolating those cases, then we don't have continued spread. And you see the numbers drop off nicely after we have mass testing in a variety of different environments and are able to find the cases. The thing I want people to focus on, however, is the incident throughout the state. And if you look at the positive incidents throughout the state, we're trending around four to four and a half percent. That is excellent. With that four percent mark, oftentimes what you would see in the bigger cities and states is a 20 to 25 percent mark. The governor is very pleased in the fact that we are running at such a low rate of positivity, and that means that we are isolating this virus and keeping people who have the disease isolated out of uh, the community, not spreading it. Uh, our point is to test, trace, and isolate. If you do feel ill, feel you have the virus, you can call your provider and get set up for testing. We do have testing available for everybody who needs to be tested in our community, and that helps us to go ahead and get ahead of that. Please call ahead if you want to be tested. I know that people have been embracing social distancing, and I see that in the community. Very pleased, I was out recently, and I saw 80% of the people in the grocery store wearing, wearing masks. And the reality is those masks can help protect somebody else from getting the disease. And the more we keep this disease from spreading, the sooner it will go down and we'll get our summer back. And I have some interesting facts now by North Dakota State University uh, School of Public Health Professor Paul Carson he explained a little bit more about what we've been seeing and what our strategy is. Dr. Carson. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Ty, if we can go to the next slide on uh, testing per 100,000 population. Um, I would just uh, point out a couple of things that suggest North Dakota really is at an advantage in battling COVID, uh, in, part, uh, in large part, I think, because our state and our governor has been very proactive about getting us testing capability and the ability to then do the follow-up contact tracing. So just looking at our testing rates per 100,000 population, you can see North Dakota ranks uh, third in the country. And in fact, we've sort of been battling with New York to be the second place uh, highest tested state uh, in the country. And that affords us a lot of uh, abilities to really try and control uh, the pandemic. And if we go to the next slide, uh, similarly on uh, the aspect of um, contact tracing, North Dakota leads the country there as well. This was a, a graph that was taken from a story on this from National Public Radio about two weeks ago, looking at um, availability of contact tracers per capita. And North Dakota um, is well staffed and well ready to follow up on, uh, on the testing positives that we identify so that we can then do, as Desi talked about earlier, um, isolation and then trying to prevent the further spread. Go to the next slide, please. Um, the next slide shows the trending of our positive cases or positive infections in the state. And I would draw your attention to the green line at the bottom. So the green line statewide is the number of new uh, cases. And <clears throat> although we do have a steady uh, number of cases uh, each day, um, because we are actively out there looking and testing and trying to find these, you'll see that that line actually looks relatively flat. We have uh, really achieved the first goal that was identified pretty much everywhere, which was flatten the curve so that we do not have a surge in cases that overwhelms the healthcare system or taxes or stretches our uh, abilities to take care of uh, these uh, patients. And that has maintained uh, a relatively flat curve. Uh, next slide. And then I would also point out a couple of other things. Uh, when you look at the Centers for Disease Control data, one of the things that they track is uh, something we call excess mortality. We, we look at trends of deaths in the United States and by state uh, over the previous several years. And then you can take that data to make a prediction as to whether or not you are seeing a higher number of deaths from something than 
than would normally be expected based on past trends. And you can see in the United States here, um, the green bars represent uh, the number of reported deaths, and the gold line represents uh, the point at which, uh, if you go beyond that, you're seeing more mortality than should be expected. And you can see for the United States out in those weeks um, in uh, April and now extending into May, uh, that the United States was indeed seeing a, an excess number of, uh, of deaths. Um, however, if you look at North Dakota, next slide, please, um, we're not really seeing that. Uh, if you look at the uh, weeks in April and extending into May, we are well below that gold line, which, which again suggests um, a higher number of deaths than would be expected based on prior year trends. We're, we're well below that, thankfully. Um, and next slide. Uh, not to be glib here, but uh, part of that part of that is because uh, we we have really good testing and tracing capability, and part of it is just virtue of the nature of our state. We are a rural state, with kind of social distancing sort of built into the way uh, we live and the way our communities are built. Um, next slide. But we do have some I issues where we have more dense urban populations. So you can see. You know, Burley and Cass and Grand Forks counties have more uh, cases than the, the rest of the state. And in Cass, we've had uh, cumulative as of yesterday about 1,580 cases, which makes up about 65% of all of North Dakota's cases. So we do have our work cut out for us in Cass County, and we're trying to address that head on with this task force. Uh, we're also, uh, next slide please, <clears throat> working close with our uh, sister community across the river with Clay County. Um, because uh, clearly Fargo-Moorhead, for example, is, is uh, really one community together. And so we need to kind of work shoulder to shoulder with our partners uh, over on the Minnesota side. And Clay County has reported about 386 cases out of their 21,960 as of uh, yesterday. Uh, Minnesota's been a little bit behind in the, the testing capability, but they're rapidly catching up with that. And in fact, um, Clay County uh, hosted a, a large testing event recently that I think will be addressed in a few minutes. Um, and then I want to just, uh, next slide, uh, go over um, uh, just a few things about a practical discussion on transmission that can help inform uh, everyone on how they approach this. <laughs> And if we can go to the next slide, which shows the role of what we call droplets, fomites, and aerosols in this. And those are sort of fancy words for what you can kind of see in this picture here on the left. Whenever we talk, uh, breathe, speak, sing, uh, uh, we emit a, a variety of sizes of respiratory droplets. And really successful transmission is exposure to amount of virus over time. So the amount of virus times time is what leads to a successful transmission. So you get a fair amount of virus uh, if you are in close proximity to someone who's emitting those larger droplets. So those larger droplets uh, carry more virus and can make it into your um, mucous membranes, and that can be a much more easy way of facilitating transmission. Some of those droplets will fall to surfaces like the ground or countertops or tables, et cetera and you may touch those and then touch your eyes or nose or mouth, and that can lead to transmission. We actually think that that surface contamination and touching is a much uh, lesser role. It's, it's, it's uh, plausible, it's real, but it's probably a much uh, lower uh, amount of risk than what is there with the close-up uh, um, uh, exposure to the larger and medium-sized droplets. And then some of those droplets will be smaller in size and can, and can float in the air and stay suspended over time. And if we go to the next slide, please, you can kind of see, get a, a, a more of a, a, a graphic display of this. You know, person B in this picture is exposed to a large variety of droplet sizes that um, is a greater volume of virus. And you can imagine that you don't need to be as much time when you're in the presence of someone close, unmasked, uh, to have a successful transmission. If you put a mask on person A, a lot of those large and medium-sized droplets will be stopped or trapped. And so masking and social distancing really help markedly diminish that transmission that occurs from person A to person B. But if you go to the next slide, uh, you can kind of see that some of those smaller droplets may diffuse out into a room over time. And if you go to then to the next slide, person C um, is exposed potentially to those smaller droplets, which carry less virus, 
But if you're in a room where you're breathing those in over time, um, you may get enough of an infectious inoculum to have a successful transmission or infection. So, uh, you know, putting a lot of this together, uh, next slide, uh, we can, we, we, we know that there's much greater risk with activities that are indoors with confined spaces over time. So that's why you'll see that our uh, Red River Valley Task Force targets, for example, workplace situations that can't really mitigate that very well, that have confined spaces with lots of people over time. Speaking, shouting, singing, emit more respiratory droplets, obviously coughing and sneezing do. And obviously the more contacts you have, the greater likelihood you're gonna come in contact with someone with this. Um, we also know that relative humidity uh, will shrink up those respiratory droplets and allow them to stay suspended in the air for longer periods of time. So that's why winter months and places like meatpacking plants where you have refrigerated rooms dry up those respiratory droplets and allow them to stay suspended and allow you to breathe in more. Lesser risks are things like outdoor activities. Um, if you open up the windows and doors, th those respiratory droplets get swept away very quickly and very efficiently. So those outdoor activities are much, much lower risk. Um, and if you can uh, ventilate a, a room well, that decreases the risk. Shorter amounts of time in a space and then uh, less talking, uh, less singing, th those sorts of things will decrease respiratory droplets and obviously fewer numbers of contacts. Uh, so uh, back to the uh, uh, emphasizing that strategy of testing, which we're doing very aggressively, tracing, we're doing very aggressively, and then uh, isolating those who um, may be exposed or may be sick uh, so that we prevent further transmission. Thank you very much, Dr. Carson. That's a great example of what we're up to, and I think you get great, great uh, slides to explain it to the people. Next, we have the North Dakota Department of Health uh, Regional Field Epidemiologist, Brenton Niesemeyer. Brenton. Thank you, Mayor. And today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about how the task force works with the state and then how we use this epi data or epidemiological data that we generate we talk all about this data all the time and what we use it for. So I'm gonna give a little bit of insight, but first how the North Dakota Department of Health um, works with the Red River Task Force. So with the COVID pandemic, COVID-19, the North Dakota Department of Health is actually the lead organization in this pandemic response. And I am kind of the liaison between the North Dakota Department of Health and the Regional Task Force, as I am a member of the Division of Disease Control, which manages the infectious diseases in the state of North Dakota on a day-to-day -day basis, even outside of COVID-19. Part of my responsibilities and part of our responsibilities with the state and how we work together is we help provide some data to the task force so that we can make decisions as a task force. Um, we provide epi data like how many persons in a particular workplace have been infected, how many persons in a particular area, how many persons from this get together became infected. And then we're also monitoring Cass County data. We're monitoring that data like Dr. Carson looked at or talked about earlier about hospitalization rates. We're monitoring number of cases. We're monitoring number of deaths. We're monitoring number of people tested and our positivity rate. And that helps us make informed decisions on what we're gonna do and how we're gonna open up the city and the state. So that data is very important. And that is why we call and ask you all those questions through our contact tracers, because we want to be able to open up the state quicker we want, we want everyone to be able to get back to their normal activities. And it is through that data that we're able to make those informed decisions so that we're not making them in haste. Another aspect of what I do is oversee our contact tracers and I support them. I answer any questions. They help refer them. Um, those hard to answer questions that they're not able to answer to me. So I'm able to reach out to them as a member of the North Dakota Department of Health and assist in training. We have many different platforms that we use, such as Maven, Dynamics, SAS, and different things that we house our data that we use to make these informed decisions. And it takes a team to 
handle all these decisions in data making. And that's just part of one of the things that we do at the North Dakota Department of Health to help the Red River Valley Task Force. And a little bit more on that epi data that we talked about. Um, you know, we talk about these workplaces and how we are going in and testing them. But what we're looking at specifically in that epi data is how many cases are in the workplace is important, but we're also diving down deeper into that data and looking at how many days did you work while infectious? How many potential people did you expose? How many days were you coughing at work versus were you asymptomatic? How many contacts did you expose or did you get it via community spread? Things like that are all important when we do make these decisions to go into the businesses. And like we talked about, this is used to drive those testing decisions. So you may see us setting up these static sites or helping the Red River Valley Task Force set up these static sites or these testing sites. And all that is epi driven. We're going into those hardest, most vulnerable populations because we want to find the cases. We want to help Cass County find these cases. And we want to get these people isolated and quarantined as quickly as possible, just so that we can stop the spread and let everyone get back to their normal play football games or soccer games out in the park. So that is kind of all that we do as EPIs. So thank you, Mayor. Send it back to you. Thank you very much, Brenton. That's a great explanation of your work and what the state's been doing. Next, we have Fargo, uh, City of Fargo Emergency Manager, Leon Schaffman. He's going to explain a little bit about what we're doing to manufacturers and we're working with the Guard and many of the testing sites. Leon? Yeah, so I'm in working with our uh, testing teams and we are going into or talking with a large number of businesses like uh, Dr. Carson had said, we look for that greater risk. We, we try and find those, those uh, businesses that have larger numbers. We look for workspaces that are more confined uh, where employees spend more than two hours in a, in a kind of a confined atmosphere. We look at that business that probably doesn't have great ventilation if you don't have the luxury of being out in the great outdoors doing your job. And then we look with, uh, with the, the epidemiologists at where those positive cases are, and those are the ones that we're really focusing on. Setting up the static sites around Fargo, um, asking businesses to reach out. Remember, we, we test, we trace, we isolate, and you can contact or uh, get more information by going to that website at Public Health. Ask your questions, we'll return your calls, and we'll reach out to you if, if there's a need. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Leon. And people have to understand we have great partnerships, Family Health Care Center, we have partnerships with the National Guard, as well as our emergency managers working in the field as well to work with people to get the testing done. Also, uh, the governor reached out to the state of Minnesota and we want to work with the state of Minnesota as well and worked with uh, Mayor Judd and then with Kathy McKay, who's the Clay County Public Health Manager. Kathy? Thank you, Mayor, and good morning, everyone. Yes, Clay County is part of the Red River Valley Task Force that was initiated by North Dakota. Cass and Clay County is considered one metro community so much of our population works in one state and lives in another, so we are very fluid. Um, we frequently do not view ourselves as being from different states, but rather that we're one metro community working together. So we are um, honored to have the Minnesota subgroup as part of the task force that aligns with Cass County's um, um, focus as far as focus testing strategies, the case investigation that we do in partnership with Minnesota Department of Health, the dissemination of the educational materials and resources, and of course the support of the contact tracing. This focus is um, supports that overarching goal of uh, this task force, which is prevention and mitigation of the community spread of COVID-19 in our metro area. So Clay County Public Health works in partnership with Minnesota Department of Health and of course the State um, Emergency Operations Center. We provide long-term liaisons 
that are working with our facilities, long-term care facilities, assisted living facilities, and others, and to support the testing, to provide information and assist with personal protective equipment. These facilities are also assigned a case manager through the Minnesota Department of Health, and they are there to help when there are identified positive cases. So our targeted testing priority groups are including the long-term care in our assisted living facilities. The Minnesota National Guard is providing the testing in each of these facilities for both staff and our residents. And we are continuing to expand that focus uh, beyond long-term care and assisted living. And we'll be looking at other congregate care settings such as corporate foster care facilities, et cetera, as they have um, positive cases as well. Um, if you're tested, the healthcare provider will contact you with the results. And as you wait for the results, um, we ask that you plan to self-quarantine, which means staying at home and limiting your interactions um, with others and following the social distance guidelines, um, which will um, help eliminate the spread. If you're positive, you'll be contacted by a case investigator. So that will either be from local public health or from the Minnesota Department of Health. And again, as Desi mentioned, this is very important to uh, have a conversation with a positive case. The purpose of this call is to help you with any resources that you might need to check on your symptoms and of course, to identify any of your contacts. Um, anyone that is considered at risk of exposure will be contacted by uh, Minnesota Department of Health for further guidance, which is the contact tracing. And during the contact tracing, uh, the positive person will remain anonymous and anyone notified during that contact tracing will not be given that name. Um, and then they'll be informed that they've been around a positive person and guidance will be provided um, in regards to monitoring themselves for symptoms and the self-quarantine. Um, Clay County Public Health is also providing the essential services to assist people in staying at home during their isolation. Uh, we did, Dr. Carson mentioned the mass testing event that occurred over Memorial Day weekend. And that testing event was requested by Governor Walls. He stated that testing, tracing, and isolating are our best tools we have for this pandemic. So he um, asked about uh, the six armory locations throughout the state of Minnesota to provide up to 6,000 tests. In Moorhead, there were over 855 tests that were completed um, at the armory with the National Guard. That was over the three days. And those residents um, will be notified soon of uh, the po any positive results that, uh, that may have occurred there. Um, and then uh, we have a slide. It will list links on the slide. Um, the governor has a Minnesota reopening chart. So there's a link noted on that slide to look at the, the reopening, um, safe reopening. There's also a link for bus Minnesota business resources. It's called DEED. It's the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. And that gives a lot of detailed information and guidance for businesses. And then, of course, we have the local resources, as you can see, um, with claycountyminnesota.gov. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. And after uh, Nicole Crutchfield will talk, we will have a time for questions, which have been uh, placed uh, online. Uh, our Director of Planning and Development, Nicole Crutchfield, is going to follow up and tell us what the COVID-19 task force is doing about wrap-up services. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, and um, to the community. Our uh, our goal as a subgroup um, is education awareness and coordination with the many partners in our community who are already doing amazing things and trying to connect those resources. So uh, we know there's many people in our community who don't watch uh, mainstream media or unfortunately are watching this press release, press conference, or and, uh, and so we're trying to connect to uh, community members who uh, uh, might have questions and uh, make sure they have clear, accurate communication about what's um, pertinent to the Cass Clay region. And because uh, we know what might be happening in New York or what might be happening in maybe a, a home country, if you're from Africa, is gonna be a different response than what's 
happening in Cache Clay and what our focus area is. So um, our focus is on communication and outreach um, through social media, working uh, closely with a lot of nonprofit groups who have um, direct links to their, their members. Um, and then working with United Way, FM Area Foundation, and Dakota Medical Foundation, who are also doing, um, along with many other um, foundations, doing great outreach uh, with the community. So what we want to do is make sure we're syncing up those systems so that they're coordinating. Uh, in addition, uh, we have a group working on what we're calling quarantine support. So as um, Brenton and Kathy were talking about, as you get, uh, as you're coordinated or contacted by a contact tracer or an investigator, you might have follow-up questions. You can certainly call back to those um, to your case manager if you have questions, but you might also have additional needs in order to stay at home. And that might be um, maybe you have uh, a needs for uh, food. Uh, maybe you're sh you don't have stable shelter and you need some sh uh, temporary sheltering so that you're safely isolating and quarantine. Or maybe you need um, financial assistance because you're not an essential worker and, uh, and uh, you need to stay at home for 14 days and all of a sudden out of that income. And so our group is working with social services and uh, many of the great partners who provide that direct assistance already and making sure the people who need it know that there's resources out there. And so it's taking us a couple weeks to, uh, to kind of add these additional services and communication tools, but um, we're working hard at it and we're working with uh, North Dakota State University, um, Cass County, Clay County, um, cities, um, and many, many nonprofits. So if you know of someone who needs this support, extra support, or you yourself need this extra support, I think step one is to call 211 and first link. They have, um, you know, they answer that phone all hours of the night. Um, and then also is to let your contact tracer know. If you're contacted by a, a contact tracer, is to let them know if you need additional support. It's okay to say you need that additional support and they will connect you to our quarantine support team. And then, um, and uh, last but not least, is don't hesitate to reach out to friend or family or someone in your community group that serves as one of your leaders, because we're trying to connect to them so they know where those resources are. And we know that word of mouth and direct communication is probably the, the most trusted resource that, that um, individuals do. So for instance, I rely on my neighbor to coordinate what's happening in my neighborhood. And, uh, and talk at that direct one-on-one -on -one level. So we're trying to work at all different levels of, of uh, coordination and communication. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you very much, Nicole. And just for people to know, 211 is answered day and night. She said night, but we'll go back to the day as well. But I uh, also want some people to know that we have uh, Mayor Bernie Dardis, Mayor J Jonathan Judd uh, on this uh, sequence, and you can see Chad Peterson in the in the picture. Uh, they have uh, opted not to make any speeches today, which is unusual for a politician, but they're going to allow that for uh, questions that people might have. We've tried to make this more an educational conference today. So Ty has some in-line uh, questions that are coming up, and he'll direct it to the participant. So this first question might be best for Brenton. It reads, if person A has close contact with a confirmed case of COVID-19, person A should go into quarantine and get tested. If the test for person A comes back negative, should they continue to stay home from work for 14 days? Thank you, Ty. And the answer to that question is yes. The, what's important to know about this test or this PCR test, it's a point in time test. So just because you test negative on Tuesday doesn't mean that you won't develop the disease on Wednesday. So it's important to stay, stay quarantined for that full 14 days to ensure that you do not spread the disease to others, regardless of any test results received during that 14 day time. We've received another question. It might be good for Brenton. Why is some contact tracing in Cass County tracing a handful of days of contact rather than two weeks? What factors determine how many days of contacts are traced and notified? So when we are doing our contact tracing, we are going back 48 hours 
prior to symptom onset or 48 hours prior to the test date for those who have no symptoms. So what we're concerned about is isolating and quarantining those people who are exposed during that most critical time point, And that is that 48 hours prior to when your symptoms started. Or if you have no symptoms, we go 48 hours prior to when you had that test done. We do also ask questions about whether or not you were exposed to anyone in those 14 days prior that were a positive case, just so that we have an idea of whether or not you were exposed to others that you may be aware of. But we wouldn't identify those persons as contacts unless they are in that window. This question might also be for Brenton and also Kathy. Uh, this question pertains to both North Dakota and Minnesota. When an individual tests positive, what are the requirements of that person's employer to ensure proper disinfection and cleaning of the individual's workplace? Are there state mandated cleaning protocols that include a report back to the state after cleaning is completed? Also, is a business then required to have all close contact staff tested? So I'll start first, Kathy, and then I'll let you answer for Minnesota. So um, when someone tests positive in a business or a workplace, we do notify the business and talk to them about cleaning and what they should do now, but we don't require this cleaning. Um, we do require um, disinfecting and sanitizing the surfaces for these essential workplaces, but we are not following up to ensure that these businesses are doing that. Um, we do ask that they do it though. And then to add the second part of that question, um, close contact staff tested. We do not require that. It's not necessarily a bad idea. If you are a close contact, you should be furloughed for those 14 days or out of work for those 14 days from your last exposure date. And then during that time, if you were to develop symptoms or seek out a test, that would be a good thing, but it's not something that we require. And then now Kathy. And, and this is Kathy. On the Minnesota side, I, I would echo what Brenton said. So it would be the exact same um, recommendations that we would be in contact with for the businesses. The Center for Disease Control recommends the disinfectants that meet the Environmental Protection Agency criteria for COVID. So we might recommend that, but it, it would be the exact same thing. There is no reporting back to local public health or to the state in regards to um, completing that cleaning. And, and the same for the, um, if there's a close contact of the employee, we follow the same uh, recommendations that Brenton just mentioned with the, the 14 days. So there's no requirement for the testing. So we, we are following that same guideline. This next question may be for Mayor Mahoney, and I don't know if anyone else would like to answer, but Governor Burgum has used the percentage of positive test results per overall testing as a measure of how safe it is to modify guidelines in the state. While overall state test numbers are low, Cass County has had fairly high positive test results. Will the task force clearly make those numbers public on an ongoing basis, and could guidelines be modified as needed based on the percentage? That's a great question, and the problem is, is that the majority of the testing now done in the state is in the Cass County area. We see as those numbers uh, evolve, we're still down to the four to five percent rate right now of positive tests out of the testing that it's done. Uh, I've uh, been discussing with the governor's staff that I think we need to open up businesses even more because at this point we're uh, tracking the testing and we're isolating the people that are positive. Uh, the idea on restaurants is perhaps to move to 75% occupancy, maybe eventually to 100. That's an option out there that's being discussed. The option is also to go county by county. We feel as the epicenter, uh, the largest city in the state, we may have some numbers because we have a greater mix of population, but feel still that our business should uh, go open up, uh, restart it needs to be done to get the economy going as well. So it's a balance, but it'll all be transparent. The public will see the numbers. And I know I'll, I'll receive emails depending on how high those numbers go, but really look at the death rate and the hospitalizations, that's what you should focus on. Thank you. Okay, and finally, this may be a question best answered by Dr. Carson. 
How is Cass County going to address a possible increase in case numbers that will follow the opening of college campuses? What is the connection of this task force to the various NDSU groups that work on opening campus? Is Cass County prepared for a potential fall increase in cases? And given the high amount of asymptomatic spread, should we start mass testing in Cass County for all residents? So I'll address the first question about uh, what's going to happen in the fall with universities starting again. Um, first, uh, is there some connection with this particular task force? Well, I'm a, a direct connection. I serve on both. I serve on the task force for the North Dakota University system uh, and, and a sub task force that's for the larger universities of uh, UND and NDSU, and I serve on the Red River Valley Task Force, so there's a, a direct uh, kind of link between those two groups. And I can tell you that um, the university system is very hard at work trying to figure out how to do this uh, um, with the restart of higher education um, safely in the fall. Uh, clearly, when you bring a lot of people in closer contact, as I just said, more contacts and indoors poses risk. So there's risk there that we are trying to figure out and mitigate. Um, how Cass County may tie into that in the state was uh, we're having ongoing conversations about what kind of testing strategies might occur in the university setting to do that more safely. And so this is going to depend a lot on what sort of testing capacity we ramp up to by the fall, and the, the governor is very intent on having uh, even markedly greater testing capacity than we already do. Um, so uh, there's going to be a number of different measures to try and mitigate that risk with uh, restart of campus. Um, the last question, which is given the high amount of asymptomatic spread, shouldn't we start mass testing in Cass County again? Um, so we have a lot of testing capacity, but we don't have infinite testing capacity. So we've got uh, the ability to uh, test quite a few people, but we want to use that the most judiciously and wisely as possible. So for example, when we had very large testing events at the Fargo Dome for a more general population, the results on that were relatively low and, um, and didn't yield nearly as much as where we've been targeting, where there have been clusters or outbreaks or high-risk settings. Uh, or people who may be at greater risk, um, that's uh, the, the more targeted testing strategy we've had, which is using uh, really pretty much our full capacity of uh, tests available to us, um, is yielding a much higher net on that, and we want to continue with that. Now, we may get to the point at some point where we really have enormous testing capacity, and then that kind of a question where we're doing more of a general population surveillance will resurface again. Very good. Good questions came in today. I hope you enjoyed the informative nature of this and more people will understand what Red River Valley COVID-19 Task Force is about. Again, we're going to have testing at positive sites. We're going to isolate those tests and hopefully keep the spread of the virus going throughout the community. As we all want to do, we want to save our summer and that's what we're working for. You see the parks have opened up. You see people out walking around doing things. Please wear your mask when you're anywhere close to people in grocery stores or in areas where you have a closed environment. But we're happy to see that people are getting out and exercising, and let's continue to work hard on getting this virus to have the numbers go down. Thank you very much, and have a great day.